This is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This week, we are offering three conversations from our podcast discussing the recent article titled Preparing for the Nash Epidemic, A Call to Action. This was endorsed by eight organizations in four different specialties. In this conversation, the group talked about reasons for optimism over future advances in patient care and therapeutic options. Two important issues were multidisciplinary cooperation among physicians and physician enlightenment in their treatment. This article points the way towards a more enlightened view of patient treatment and multidisciplinary cooperation in the future. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. Stephen Harrison. That statement should go to Capitol Hill, right, Andrew? So the minute that gets incorporated into the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines, becomes a HEDIS measure, that's where we begin to actually drive change. Again, it's multi-pronged, multi-focused. You know, there's lots of different ways that need to be gotten after. And and it, it's going to be multifaceted. It's going to be what we're doing on Capitol Hill. It's going to be the patient, direct patient education. And it's going to be publications like like what what Ken uh, has pioneered with others. Roger Green. So so let me let me toss one out to Andrew. Andrew Jeff Lazarus had this really I thought interesting thought last week, and it was when Stephen said he just that he triggered it. Which is Lazarus's comment is any patient picked up at F two or F three forget cirrhosis picked up at F two or F three for the first time that should be called a late diagnosis, and that should be a kept statistic. Which I loved because it was the first key performance indicator I had heard that you could very simply measure and tell a health system, hey, you guys are getting this wrong. Andrew. Scott. That's kind of been one of the ideas we were hoping to see change when we added some of the ICD-10 codes. We made that push to get now early versus advanced hepatic fibrosis coding put in the system. Going forward, it will be vital for us to have clarification on what, what stage a patient is in, and, and we can then use the different populations as we make our point. I mean, one thing we have to keep in mind is Capitol Hill, they sometimes want the big numbers, but they also want to know that it's a addressable problem. And knowing that if you have a certain population, and that's why we've been trying to at least get the conversation happening with the most at risk for now, but also kind of thinking of the entire spectrum as well. But, you know, really just helping them see clearly that this is an addressable problem right now. Something needs to be done. And and I want to kind of briefly mention, too, kind of going back to a point that was just mentioned by both Stephen and, and Ken, some of the most successful meetings that we have had on Capitol Hill have when you've been able to have the doctor, whether it's the hepatologist, endocrinologist, gastroenterologist, or whoever, and a patient in the room together talking to legislators. And having that clinician who's able to provide their experiences paired with the research, the data, with the lived experiences of the patient is extremely impactful. That's what's most exciting when you see research like this coming out with many different societies joined in support, including patient advocacy organizations, but also letters like we have led and other initiatives that we have worked on that have been with collective, because that is going to be so important, having that patient side of the table and the clinician side of the table there together, kind of approaching it from two different angles, making the point and hitting them with the the most important data and valuable information. Tony Viliotti. Yeah, I agree with that yeah, very much, Andrew. Our experience has been that the story really carries a lot of weight. It's one thing to you know, rattle off some statistics to a person, but they relate much more to the story, an individual story. And that, that's one of the things we try to do. Ken Kusi. Well, Andrew, expanding a little bit on what you said, there's a blueprint for this in the diabetes field. I work at the VA, and again, we get evaluated on whether you missed or not visit to the eye doctor, or you didn't measure in the urine protein, if you didn't check blood pressure, A1Cs. I think that the blue, the easiest path is because people with type 2 diabetes are at greater risk. And there are diabetes medications that can treat both, that that would be where I would emphasize the screening. The, the screening that we propose to Steve in the paper is not very expensive. It's not perfect. But even the two-tier test between the FIB4 and some imaging with elastography is not prohibitively expensive. It's not more expensive than an eye exam. It's cheaper or a protein urine test. And if you're negative, well, then maybe you, you can not, you don't have to do it every every year, even every other 
other year or every third year, it's still debatable. But that blueprint of mandatory testing will go a long way because in the diabetes field now, we don't choose the drugs based on their A1C re- re- reducing capacity, but on their complications. So some medications can reduce heart failure, like SGLT2 inhibitors. Others can promote weight loss. So pioglitazone could be reserved for those people with diabetes who have NASH or or a suggestion of advanced fibrosis without needing to do a biopsy. You'll lower their A1C and, by the way, may do some good for their liver. Yeah, I see a lot of similarities between, I mean, in some ways we're almost, with NASH, we're just kind of five years behind where diabetes advocacy is. And we're trying to to use some of those techniques to kind of move the field forward on the advocacy side of things. And that especially includes, of course, partnering with Endocrine Society, AGA, and and ACE. But also, you know, we look forward to partnering with ADA more uh, as we go forward, because having both the kind of patient sides of of this of the same coin are valuable here. There's a lot of lessons to be learned there. And we've been trying to kind of take that guidance as we move forward. And on the screening point specifically, that's one thing where we hope with our Beyond the Biopsy initiative, really stressing that there are tools available now that can be used instead of biopsy. And biopsy, you know, as we well know, naturally is a barrier for a variety of reasons. So that, you know, obviously presents its own set of challenges and getting us past that is is vital as well. So we look forward to kind of working collectively to do that also. Let me just throw a flare into this thing for a sec, which is that, Andrew, I get the point that goes, we might be five years behind diabetes on the advocacy side. But one of the things that really struck me when I saw the survey numbers was the lack of any significant difference between endos and primary care in terms of what they knew right, wrong, or indifferent about this disease. Now, I've also been told otherwise that endos don't order NASH tests in any discernible difference from other elements of the population that should know any more about that. So I I think that on the advocacy side, we might do fine. My question to Steve and and Ken, I guess more, would be, and Ken, I don't mean to pick on endocrinologists. You're you're, you're everybody's hero in in this world. Hey, let let me say one thing about endocrinologists. I did a survey of my own. I have a registry here in Texas and we mine the registry and we go out to endocrine clinics and do fiber scans. We go to GI clinics and do fiber scans. I was blown away when we were looking at data entry for baseline LFTs. GI docs, 25% of the time only had LFTs. Endocrine, 75% of their patients had LFT checks. I don't know if it's because of statin use or what it was, Ken, but you guys do a whole lot better job of at least ordering liver function test or liver chemistry test uh, compared to my own GI colleagues. So kudos to you for that. Amen. But then, Stephen, so the flip side is I'm also told that there's no meaningful relationship in terms of people who look at order patterns between what comes out of those LFTs and whether any other NASH tests like fit 4s or anything get ordered. So I think they're doing a great job on liver enzymes. Now you just got to translate. You got to take it one more step, really. Well, you're absolutely right. My point was, or the, the point I was wanting to expand on that is liver is important to endocrinologists or you wouldn't be ordering liver chemistry tests. It's not, it's not just part of a comprehensive panel where you're checking the cholesterol. What, I mean, these were tests that had to be ordered by the endocrinologist separate, liver chemistry tests, liver function tests. And so there is a sense that, that the liver is there. And there's a test that you can use to measure whether it's irritated or inflamed. It, we know it's not 100% accurate. We know you can have fatty liver and have completely normal liver enzymes. That you can have wildly abnormal liver enzymes. There's really not a lot going on if you do a liver biopsy. And we know there's inherent limitations on that. But the point is, endocrinologists are aware of liver disease. Now, I think it should be relatively easy to take that next step and say, let's translate that into a, let's look at the liver chemistry chemistry test and let's do something with those when they're abnormal. Ken, I'd love to, <laughs> love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I've been giving this a lot of thought for a long time. So they are and they look at it, I think, in great sense because of statin use and some, but they also want to make sure that they don't have very elevated liver enzymes, which would immediately trigger a consult to you guys. My, in part also because the ADA has said that if liver enzymes are elevated, again, with this very high cutoff of 40, which would be like saying you have diabetes with an A1C of seven and a half, has triggered that. What I see 
uh, a disconnect is that in general, unless the enzymes are clearly elevated, it doesn't trigger much action. Second is I think most of my peers have a very basic knowledge of liver enzymes or NASH and do not have the concept that you can have significant disease with liver enzymes below 40. And I would have to, I have many friends in the ADA, but I would have to blame a little bit the ADA that has just recommended screening if your liver enzymes are above 40 or if you have steatosis, which we usually don't measure. So in the end, the vast majority doesn't get tested. In our studies of Steve and ours, a minority of patients, I think maybe 20 or 30 percent had liver enzymes above this very high cutoff. So I think the ADA is going to have to step it forward, even as we don't have 10-year data on outcomes and natural history. Just take the risk of doing this very inexpensive testing once a year for everybody with type 2 diabetes and learn what good comes out of that, that I think will be very, very critical. I think 10% of the people will have a drastic change in their management based on those results. Well, Ken, we're, we're happy to help ADA on that mission. Tony and I, GLI and Nash Knowledge are happy to work collaboratively with ADA to update their guidelines and make things make sure that happens. A comment and review from Louise Campbell. They're certainly not looking for simple steatosis. Kathleen Corey discussed that really well at Arsenal, and I've commented on this a couple of times, where a significant portion of patients were just absolutely caught on their CT scans as having fatty liver. So they followed them independently as part of the study rather than exclude them purely because they had full liver scans. And they went on 75% increased risk of first cardiac event. And that was simple steatosis. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. I'm thinking I'm exactly right, Andrew. One guideline changes the world, right? One, one guideline from a reputable organization changes the world on this. Well, it certainly gets the ball rolling. I'm not sure it's going to change the world, but it, it'll it get the ball rolling. I no, I'll think. take Ken's definition. It changes it slowly, Stephen. It's not going to change it overnight, but it moves the momentum in a whole different direction. I agree with that. We, we hope that this paper, to be honest, it doesn't say anything that Steve or any in this podcast didn't know. We hope it will make people who are more focused on other problems think more in a liver-centric fashion. I remember when I was doing doing my endocrine training, educating primary cares about microalbuminuria. I remember, Roger, you may know this. Uh, you're probably, we're in the same boat here. So so I think these things did, can change. Did they have insulin back then, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it had just come out. It had just come out. <laughs> you had to go to Toronto to get it this year. <laughs> but that's a good point. I'm but kidding. to be honest, I mean, never before in the past 20 years we've worked in this, has there been such a confluence of different angles, and treatments, interest in diagnosis, big pharma, people knowing. And the girls are very interested, but there's a little bit of a disconnect on what to do about it. That That's where the really the problem lies, I think. Right, I would agree. So, Tony, what should we do about it from where you sit? Well, interestingly enough, I've been appointing with, with my endocrinologist tomorrow morning. So I, I may ask her what, you know, what her view on... on harass so him, is, harass is, him. Make him, make him work <laughs> a little bit harder because people always say, well, we can't take care of another complication. We're busy busy enough. There are big structural problems. This health care of 20-minute visits just doesn't work. And there has to be better retribution for the work of clinicians, from pediatricians to endocrinologists and clinicians in general. But beyond those structural changes, that doesn't mean that we can't do a little bit more to prevent cirrhosis. Yeah, and one of the things that we've been working on, I've been invited by a local diabetes group to be an exhibitor at a conference they're having here locally in Pittsburgh. And I'll be there to talk to the endocrinologist about liver disease and the relationship with diabetes. So we have to keep hammering away at that. This isn't something that stands alone off by itself. A lot of talk about diabetes and a lot of talk about obesity, but you just don't hear, you know, Roger, you know, I've heard you, heard you before say the liver is an organ, you know, it's a Roddy Dangerfield of, of our organs. And, uh, you know, and that, that is true. Um, and, you know, I just think in, we just need to keep hammering away at those people who come in contact with people who might be at risk for liver disease. Yeah, Andrew, go ahead. You look like you have something, you have something in mind. Well, I mean, I just, I, I couldn't agree more with what Tony is saying. And I think really the key as we go forward, I think this is a point that has been stressed on, on this podcast before, but, but education and education, whether that's educating patients to have a conversation with their clinicians 
clinicians or educating clinicians that are outside of hepatology about the risks of NASH. And it's going to require the advocacy community working there, that side, obviously patient advocacy organizations, but also it's going to require medical societies to acknowledge the problem as well, whether that's through guideline changes and more. But I think, you know, there there is at least a growing acknowledgement now that there is a real problem. There is at least for those that know, like all of us on today's podcast, that there are options available. And it's just kind of getting the word out more now and then empowering those, whether it's clinicians or patients, to then share with others, whether that's on Capitol Hill or with their peers, the, the available options as well. Okay. So we're getting towards the end of Ken's hour. Okay. So I want to go to a final question. Let him answer first. Then if he has to leave, he has to leave, right? I wonder what you think the tipping points we can control today are. Obviously, first of the next generation of NASH drugs will be a major tipping point because it'll put a drug in the market and it'll put a lot of investment behind education. But before we get there, because that might be another two years, right? Year and a half, two years. Before we get there, what are the tipping points that we can shape in the interim? What can we do to meaningfully change the equation, speed the momentum? Well, again, it's not a single thing as been said by, by the others here. But if I had to choose before we have a drug that will take still at least a couple of years is A, patient education, patient learning. Oh, well, I may have a problem. I'm going to ask my doctor. B, society is getting actively involved and our little contribution with this article attempted to do that. But here and even in the international arena, I also help a little bit with what Lazarus was doing. So all this interconnection, increase awareness, it, it's just like the campaigns that cut down smoking and high cholesterol. It's a little bit at every level. But if I had to choose in the short term, patient education, clinician education, which many times is helped through the societies. And then what Andrew and Tony are doing, working from the roots and working in legislation to bring this to to a level that it's something important. And I would add to that, that a podcast like this never existed prior to the pandemic. And now this is a voice to what, 20,000 downloads? So far, 21 now. Yeah. A, a publication like just came out, brought together everybody you see here on the podcast. And now we discuss that. And a physician or a patient may not have recognized that that manuscript came out, but they did listen to the podcast. And now they'll want to go learn more about it. So again, to your point, Ken, every different media avenue to deliver this message is important, whether it's in print, whether it's on a podcast, whether it's in person, whether it's on Capitol Hill or in our clinics. We need to pound the same message and keep it simple, stupid. Tony, go ahead. Our focus talking about, about short term. I think we're trying to do some things in the short term that have a long term impact. For example, you know, we think the issue, the major issue with this lack of awareness is that people grow up without knowing anything about their liver and how important it is and how to keep it healthy. That was certainly my case and every, everyone I talked to. So we've, we've actually developed lesson plans to be used in the education system to teach kids the importance of the liver. We've also developed some animated videos to teach younger children about how important their liver is and how they can, can take care of it. So we're trying to plant a lot of seeds that hopefully will bear fruit. And it may take a while. And I'm, I'm 75 years old, so hopefully it doesn't take too long. Just kind of plugging away every, every day at the, just doing whatever we can do to raise awareness. The rousing British cheering you heard in the background was the voice of Louise Campbell listening to this later and going, yeah, that's exactly right. Because she would have been all over that, all over that, had she been here today. Go ahead, Andrew. I'll keep it shorter, but I couldn't agree more with that everything that's been said, you know, I echo all the points that have been said. I think the one other thing that is an immediate available option to all of us, and it's one of the things that this podcast today has done, but it's just kind of the building of bridges across societies, across advocacy organizations. There doesn't need to be a sense of ownership to Nash. It doesn't need to fall into one category. We can think outside of just, we need to think outside of just the liver. We need to think of liver health overall. And as Stephen mentioned earlier, that groundswell, you know, to build that, it has to be a full health community effort. We've seen the beginning of that, you know, whether that's through the letters we send, our U.S. National Action Plan, the article that, that Ken is, has led, this podcast and more, it's happening, but we just need to keep doing that and keep getting everyone at the table. So, Andrew, I don't remember, are you are you in the middle of getting your MBA or do you have your MBA? I'm in the middle of getting it right now, at night. When, you, when you're done, it will break a record because we will have two MBAs on this podcast at the same time. And the reason I mention that is that one of the things they teach in B-School, at least they taught me in B-School, is that people do what's inspected, not what's expected. So, 
when I talk about things like heat measures and KPIs and guidelines and pathways, it is so critical for people to be evaluated based on whether they're doing the right thing once we've taught them what the right thing is to do. And I'm kind of looking at you in the eye when I say that because when we talk about preventive task force, that's exactly where I go. We need that idea, for example, of late diagnoses and maybe one or two other things that we can turn into real simple metrics that we can persuade everybody that the cost effectiveness is there to measure today and the tools are there to manage today. If I have to do one thing before drugs show up, I think that's the one that is going to take more focused energy, but would have great value. Not that the education isn't important. It is not that everything we're doing isn't important. It is, but we're going to pay it off when people metricate it. That'd be my two cents. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about this content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next Wednesday, August 25th, with our guest, Dr. Arun Sanyal, to examine the different issues and opportunities offered by fibroblast growth factors, or FGF agents. FGF21 agents are pointing the way towards an exciting therapeutic future. And I can't imagine two better teachers on this subject than Arun Sanyal and Stephen Harrison. It's an important topic, and we're thrilled to bring this episode to you. I hope you will join us then. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.